We've already been introduced to what we are going to be talking about today, which is uh, Buddhism and vegetarianism. Venerable Tula Lube himself actually made a very strong case for why uh, it would benefit us all if we were vegetarians. We're going to be getting into a discussion. Kembo Karma is, of course, going to be talking about vegetarianism with Buddhism. And we have David Young, who will be talking about vegetarianism and environment. Emily Pearson, who will be talking about vegetarianism and health. So we're going to be looking at it quite holistically today. And they have a lot of experience and what they're going to be sharing today. They've actually been living what they're going to be sharing with you today. Good evening, Na. We're going to be getting into a discussion. Kembo Karma is, of course, going to be talking about vegetarianism with Buddhism. And we have David Young, who will be talking about vegetarianism and environment. Emily Pearson, who will be talking about vegetarianism and health. So we're going to be looking at it quite holistically today. And they come from a very, um, they have a lot of experience in what they're going to be sharing today. They've actually been living what they're going to be sharing with you today, including Kembo Karma himself. Also, before we uh, begin our discussion, I'd like to inform you that I am, I am open to receiving tweets on my phone. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Tamgizam. If you don't want to get up and ask questions later, you're most welcome to tweet them to me while we are talking to each other here. And I can ask the questions for you um, to our panelists here. Uh, the mic will also be passed around towards the end of the discussion. We're looking at about uh, 30 to 35 minutes of Q&A, including Q&A with the panelists and myself, and also questions from the floor. Every speaker is going to be begin by um, talking at least 10 minutes on the topics that you've been given. I'd like to introduce you now to Kembo Karma. He joined the monastic community after completing high school. He joined, he became a monk at the age of 16. He graduated from Tango University. He studied under His Excellency the Tsulalobe and the late um, Dralop Kilegete. Kembo has studied in the U.S. as well and holds a master's degree from Narupa University from Boulder, Colorado Lab. And David Yang is an iconic young leader from Hong Kong. Uh, besides managing his investments in retail business, as well as a family charity foundation, he is the co-founder of something, a movement called Green Monday, which is gaining quite a bit of momentum and has gained momentum over the last couple of years in Hong Kong. Uh, his success in championing the Green Movement has won him numerous awards, such as um, Man of the Year, Local Heroes, and Best Idea of the Year. He was also selected by the in quotes, the purpose economy in the USA as one of the 300 global pioneers who create a better future. Google, Standard Chartered, the Hong Kong Airport Authority, Bank of China, Wheelock, and Great Eagle among the blue chip companies and organizations in Hong Kong that are long-term partners of Green Monday. Uh, David Young has been a vegetarian for 13 years successfully, which is the same number of years I've been vegetarian as well successfully as well. <laughs> and Emily Pearson is a certified holistic health coach. Uh, she has been a vegetarian since her early teens as well. And uh, because she was inspired by how a holistic lifestyle can enhance and transform health, as well as emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. Emily completed the health educator program at the uh, Hippocrates Health Institute in Florida. And uh, she also holds a certification in plant-based nutrition from E. Cornell University. She is an internationally certified yoga teacher and has traveled extensively in search of truth and well-being. So these are the people I'm honored to be sitting with here today. Um, I'd like to request Kembo to begin, actually, and talk. Uh, it's up to you if you'd like to sit, if you'd like to stand. Thank you all for joining us here. And first, let me thank um, everyone involved in making this event happen, especially to His Eminence to Lolopen for creating this talk, and to the Secretary and all the members involved uh, from the Executive Office of His Eminence, Kelwa Tokamba, and to our host, to Royal Institute of Management, and to, our, and to Ms. Namgizam for being our moderator, and all the VVS crew, and 
our esteemed speakers here coming all the way to share your knowledge with us. Thank you all very much. Well, the topic today, Buddhism and vegetarianism. When we hear this topic, the first question that arises in our mind is, was Buddha vegetarian? The answer would be no. Should Buddhists be vegetarians? The second question that arises in our mind is that. And I would prefer actually saying yes. And these are the reasons that why I would say yes, to, you know, why Buddhists should be a vegetarian. First, as a Buddhist, we have taken refuge in Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. To take refuge in Dharma, one must practice non-violence to sentient beings. Thus, if we pr continue to eat meat, which has come from slaughtering the animals of innocent, innocent animals, then is this not contradiction to our Buddhist commitment? Although Lord Buddha never made it a compulsory rule that all his followers have to be vegetarians, but he strongly encouraged us to be. The core of Buddhist teaching is the practice of minimizing harm and benefiting good to all living beings as much as possible and taming one's mind. I believe the practice of vegetarianism, equipped with compassion and loving kindness and wisdom plays an essential role as we can see in most of the Buddhist recorded teachings. The Angulimalaya Sutra quotes a dialogue between Buddha and Manjushri. There Manjushri asked, quote, do Buddhas not eat because not eat meat because of Tathagata Garbha? Buddha said, Manjushri, that is so. There are no beings who have not been one's mother, who have not been one's sister through generations of wandering in samsara. Therefore, one's own flesh and the flesh of another are a single flesh, so Buddhas do not eat meat. Furthermore, in Lankavatara Sutra, quote, Buddha said, all monks who live purely and all bodhisattvas who refrain from walking on grass, how can they agree to uproot it? How then can those, pra those practitioners who practice great pra compassion feed on the flesh and the blood of a living being? I'm just quoting this few of many Hinayana and Mahayana Sutra that states about refraining oneself from consuming meat and its adverse effect in life. The second point that I'm going to make here is, as a Mahayana Buddhist, Buddhist practices four immeasurables, the Jamba, Ningje, Gawa, and Tangyum. Which, and out of that, here I'm just going to give you an idea of why why Buddhists should not eat meat. Out of why Buddhists does not should not eat meat, and the reason is that Buddhism refrains from eating meat out of loving kindness and compassion for all living beings, as we can see clearly in Chapter Seven of Nirvana Sutra. That quote, "Blessed Son." Meeting it hinders the development of compassion. Therefore, all who follows the way of Buddha should not eat meat from now on, unquote. Therefore, the compassion is an important way of learning to be a better person. Being without compassion is simply incompatible with being Buddhist or a better person. Since compassion is the root of Dharma, and, is the compa and with compassion, it is impossible to eat meat. Just think of an intense pain accidentally stepping on a nail is. So how can one have a heart to eat flesh of a creature who has suffered of a pain being slaughtered, skinned, dismembered, and cooked? So preventing the suffering of living creatures by not eating their flesh to satisfy our taste buds is a minimal expression of loving kindness and compassion we can offer to all living beings. And furthermore, we should choose not to kill out of loving kindness and not to eat out of compassion. Buddha also states that eating of meat extinguishes the kind, the seed of great kindness, adding that all and every kind of meat, even of animals found dead, is prohibited by him. He insists that his followers should not eat any kind of meat, that even vegetarian food that has been touched by meat should be washed before being eaten. All Buddhists on the path to freedom eventually relinquish eat meat eating. Buddha in his previous life as Bodhisattva cut his own flesh to feed an eagle then let it eat a smaller bird. Having a kind and compassionate heart will show up in all aspects of one's life. But the simplest and the foremost way, I think, is to follow the vegetarian diet. Those who argue that Buddha's condemnation, condemnation of meat applies only to Theravadayana and Mahayana is not related, are clearly indicating that their lack of proper knowledge and misunderstanding. The Mahayana Sutra states that meat eating is a diet that convolutes the three realms. It's a sword that severs the potential for liberation. 
It's a fire that burns the seat of Buddhahood. It's the shaft of lightning that ends rebirth in higher realms or the precious human birth. Thus, Mahayana practitioners who purchase the path of Bodhisattva for enlightenment avoid meditating to cultivate compassion for all living beings. The, while in Theravada Buddhism, meditating is provided for the purpose of cultivation of loving kindness. Even in Vajrayana, meat, eating, meat is forbidden until one attains the pure perception. Furthermore, Guru Padma Sambhava clearly said in his Dharma teachings, all the followers of Buddha, monks and nuns, novice and lay, have seven main principles to follow. These are the four root principles and abstinence from alcohol, meat, evening food. Fully and Guru Rinpoche fully condemned eating of meat for both lay and ordinary people. In brief, becoming vegetarian is like irrigating and sowing the seeds of compassion and kindness to cultivate the flower of liberation later. Third, the results. Consumption of meat brings for the impurity and negative effects in this life and future lives. The negative consequences of eating meat in this life include short life, aggressive behavior, and diseases like high blood pressure, and cirrhosis of liver, and cancer to name a few. In all these diseases, link has been established to animal fat and cholesterol. So the consequences of eating meat are in fact immediate and in clear view. In future lives, one would be reborn in lower realms, full of suffering, and even if born as a human, would have a short life, ill-smelling, sem- Ill contemptuous, and born deprived, deprived of intelligence. While on the other hand, a person who habitually eats pure vegetarian food keeps one's body and mind in the pure state and eventually free oneself from the samsara, as stated in Surangama Sutra, where Buddha said, if a person can control his mind and body, and thereby refrain from eating animals and pro- animal products, I will say he will be really liberated. Judging by those negative consequences in consul- consuming meat and being a vegetarian, if we approach this question as one of weights and balances, then the scale has tipped drastically to the side of not eating meat. So therefore, the choice of becoming vegetarian is of all moral choice we can make, one of the most beneficial and the simplest way. Furthermore, I encourage those who want to become vegetarian to try it once or twice in a month on a full moon and a new moon day with a good motivation for veganers. Or if possible, during the first and fourth lunar more for, for longer duration when the sale of, mistri- sale of meat is restricted, just give a try and see because a journey of thousands of miles starts with a single step, isn't it? In ancient India, for instance, the great Ashoka enforced a law against killing animals. Similarly, in Bhutan today, under the auspices of His Majesty, the fourth Rukelpo, and under the guidance of His Majesty, the King, the central monastic body with the support from royal government and the public, has initiated many different plans to curb the consumption of meat, in the meat and killing of animals in the kingdom. Some of the plans include restriction of offering meat dishes during the summer retreat in monasteries, offering of meal and cash payment at the cremation sites were restricted, abolishing of age-old tradition of sacrificing animals to the local deities, and the restriction of offering meat during annual loche, etc., as you're all aware of it. My attempt today here is to provide an information in general, and especially, to, especially, in, the con- especially in the Buddhist consta- context, but not to criticize and offend others. Moreover, I'm simply just talking about the walk, but neither do I walk the talk. In conclusion, all I can say, say is that you should be left to your sensibilities and aesthetics to decide for yourself. So my dear friends, use your clear conscience to know what you wish to do and make a choice, a pure choice, not out of fear, hatred, desire, and disrespect, but out of respect for oneself, humanity, deeper principle of compassion, and harmlessness. Karinche. Thank you, Le Kimball. David's going to be talking about Buddhism and environment. Well, first of all, it's a real honor to be invited to be one of the speakers at this panel. Um, this is my second time in Bhutan, and coming here, um, it very much feels like home. Um, I'm, a, I'm a 13-year Buddhist um, based on my volunteer, voluntary will, but in terms of my whole life, I'm actually born in a Buddhist family. So um, it feels particularly close uh, whenever I come to uh, Bhutan. And um, today, of course, um, my part is to talk about the 
correlation, the relationship between vegetarianism and the environment. Uh, I think a lot of people practice vegetarianism from a personal standpoint, of course, from a health standpoint, from a uh, compassion standpoint, or, and of course, from a religious standpoint. Um, and one issue is that from all of these standpoints, personal health, religious, compassion, it, it, it comes from the person. And if you talk to an organization, if you talk to a corporation, or if you talk to a government, well, Bhutan being a very few exception because Bhutan is a Buddhist country. But other than that, it's very hard to bring out the interests of a country or of a company why they should support vegetarianism. After all, this is your personal choice, right? So as much as people should respect vegetarian, they would say that you should also respect meat eaters. So I guess one of the bottleneck of promoting vegetarianism in so many years is how can we engage the society across the board to be on this chapter, to support this together? We can, can we find a common ground so that any companies, any organizations, any government, and of course any human being can be together? And I guess uh, from an environment standpoint, that is one way that we can break the ice, that we can break the barrier, and can bring everyone together. So um, I started vegetarianism when, uh, in 2001, so about 13 years ago. And that is, at that point, it was a personal choice. Um, I actually started vegetarianism when I was in New York. I spent a total of over a decade living in New York. I studied uh, engineering and economics at Columbia University. Um, and when I first started vegetarian in New York, it was actually quite easy because uh, around me, you can see a lot of people, even if they are not full vegetarian, they are flexitarian. Flexitarian meaning uh, they are vegetarian, let's say one day a week or a few days a week. And when I went to restaurants um, that are you know, either full vegetarian or have a lot of green choices, I noticed that um, people around me were, number one, they were very young, many of them very fashionable, and it's something that is considered very forward thinking, it's a hip thing to do. And then I moved back to Hong Kong and to Asia in 2003, and I noticed a very big contrast uh, when, when I look around vegetarian restaurants in Hong Kong, I see people that are like grandparents. <laughs> uh, parents or grandparents. You very, s very rarely do you see a table of four or six or eight young people um, eating vegetarian. And I encounter a lot of questions um, because at that time I was only in my tw 20s. And they would ask me, you know, what happened to me? You know, am I sick? You know, is, is there some special reason that I'm vegetarian? And sometimes, of course, I would explain from a health standpoint, from a you know, compassion standpoint. But then you know, people say, OK, that's your, that's your point of view. That's not my point of view. So finally, there's one killer argument that I would make, and they finally would listen. And I say, well, OK, compassion, health, you know, maybe you think that's my personal choice. But there's one element that is our collective choice, and that is our concern for the environment. Now, I guess I can ask any human being on the planet, any country, and I say, well, is there anyone who doesn't care about the environment? Is there anyone who wants to have a worse environment? You know, if there's one, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Okay. I, I highly doubt it. Okay. I think we all want a better environment because we know um, we have a lot of issues with our planet. But very few people know that all these issues that we are facing from a global environmental standpoint actually has to do with our meat consumption. Now, out of all the problems that we have in the world with environment, what is the number one problem? You know, what is the number one issue that, I don't care if you're in Scotland, in Netherlands, in China, Japan, US, Thailand, India, we all influence. And that issue is called global warming. And I think with global warming, we always use a term called, let's try to reduce our carbon footprint, live a low carbon lifestyle. Now, with low carbon lifestyle, what do we think? We say, well, let's use less transportation. Let's try to transfer from gasoline cars to maybe electric vehicles. Okay, so the first things that come to mind is transportation. 
But one element that I would tell all my friends who are meat eaters is that, guess what? The United Nations has been talking for over a decade. This is not from 2013, this is not from 2010. This is from 10 years ago that the UN has been saying the biggest reason for global warming is actually not transportation, it's the livestock industry, it's the meat industry. Between a cow and a car, everyone would think the car is the one that does more damage, right? Okay. Of course, the car is the one that gives out the most carbon emission. Actually, it's not even close. It's the cow. The cow give out a type of gas besides carbon dioxide. They also give out a type of gas called methane. And methane is about 23 to 25 times worse in terms of greenhouse gas effect than carbon dioxide. So for example, one car, one cow give out the type of greenhouse gas, the amount of greenhouse gas that one cow give out per year is equivalent to a compact car driving 86,000 kilometers. I drive to work every day in Hong Kong, so in that sense, I'm not very green. Okay, S half an hour to work, half an hour back home. I have driven my car for five years, I'm only at 50,000 kilometers. So 86 thousand kilometers would be equivalent to seven to eight years of driving. That's equivalent to one cow, one year. If you compare the carbon emission between, let's say, eating beef, eating pork, and eating veggie, look at the bar on the right. You can see big difference. This is the, ty this is the amount of greenhouse gas used to produce one kilogram of protein. And you see beef, pork is significantly higher than tofu or other types of veggie. Now this is only one element of carbon footprint. The other element of carbon footprint is the transportation. Um, if you import your meat from far away, then the carbon footprint is even worse. Now this is only one element why eating meat is bad for the planet. The other element is Actually, which is the biggest threat to global sustainability is simply that our planet cannot feed, cannot generate enough food to feed all human beings. We are in 2014 right now, and globally, the biggest topic when you talk about sustainability is that this planet simply cannot generate enough food for people. Right now, there are seven billion people globally. Uh, that's our global population. It is expected to rise to 9 billion people in 40 years. So by 2050, we will have about 9 billion people. But guess what? Even today, at least 1 billion people are suffering from famine. At least 1 billion people. Now, so you would say, is that purely because, you know, you know, those countries may be poor, or what is the reason? Actually, the reason is because the food that is grown, the veggie, you know, the corn, the crops that is grown, a lot of them are consumed by animals before they are consumed by us. So let's say the same piece of land that can be used to feed, let's say, 10,000 human beings. If you use those land to grow crops to feed cows, then to feed us, you cannot feed 1,000. So actually, eating animals is a very inefficient way of food generation. That's only from a land standpoint. From a water standpoint, the contrast or the difference is even more dramatic. Um, of course, we know about water conservation. Everyone knows that we should save water, right? Because clean water is scarce. Right now, close to 1.5 billion people do not live in environment that have clean water. And by 2030, so only 15 years later, that number will rise to 3 billion people who will not have access to clean water. So that's why, for example, we would say that, hey, if you take shower, try to take shorter time, right? Um, in Hong Kong, they promote at least taking one less minute of shower per day. And they say, by taking one less minute of shower, you can save 10 liters of water. 10 liters of water. So this is how many liters? <laughs> this is one liter. So 
taking one less minute equivalent to 10 bottles of this. That's good. But if you eat one less piece of stick, just eat one less piece of stick, you save 4,600 liters of water, which is equivalent to 4,600 bottles of this. Just one piece of stick. Because from the day the cow is born to the day the slaughter, to meat processing, to finally come to our plate, it, that cow or that animal consumes a lot of food and a lot of water. So it is a super inefficient way of food production. So next year, for example, in Milan is the World Expo. It will be held in Milan, Italy. And National Geographic just did a, um, a piece, a cover story, just two months ago. It's called Food Revolution. And the theme of Milan Expo is called Feeding the Planet. It's that doesn't matter if you're talking about sustainability, talking about global warming, talking about humanity, health, in every way. Eating less meat is the way to go green. But the interesting, and in a way a little bit ironic thing, is that eating less meat is the healthiest, easiest, well, in a way also of most affordable way to go green. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost you anything. It's easy, it's affordable, it's healthy, and of course, it is also humane. So we started a movement in Hong Kong called Green Monday just two years ago, um, advocating everyone, any company, any organization, and of course restaurants, to simply go meatless one day a week at a minimum. Of course, you feel free to do more, but one day a week. If you cannot do one day, one meal a week, you can do it one meal a week. And we're happy to say that in two years, it used to be that in Hong Kong, no one, very, very few people care about vegetarianism because Hong Kong is the capital of gourmet. So people love food from everywhere, lobsters, steak, you know, the best food from everywhere. But now, 23% of Hong Kong population, which is equivalent to 1.6 million people, are now practicing Green Monday, at least. And of those 23%, half are actually practicing vegetarianism half the time. And then 3% of Hong Kong population now is a full vegetarian. So um, I guess that is one of the reasons why you know, the Hong Kong government um, and many, many corporations, um, they are all supporting this because they know this is a great way for them to fulfill their social responsibility. And this is a great way for them to help create a more sustainable future. Um, so in the Q&A session, I guess we will share more about um, some, of the, some of the experience that we do Green Monday in Hong Kong and also beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to be reacting to whatever you shared later, so I'm going to be uh, reserving my comments at the moment. But I'd like to now invite Emily to talk about vegetarianism and health. It's such an honor to be here and to be a part of such an amazing conference and with such amazing guest speakers as well. Um, as you've heard already, there's many different reasons why people go vegetarian, whether it's for the environmental reasons and global warming impacts or the religious um, or compassion for animals. There's many different reasons. But for me, originally, it was definitely for health reasons. And then all the other reasons came later on. But um, I thought I'd start by telling you a bit about my personal story and how I became vegetarian and what led me to be interested in it. Um, from a young age, I suffered from severe allergies, skin problems. I had acne all over my face. I had a lot of digestive problems. And um, I spent most of my teenage years on medication from antibiotics to steroids and with no real results. Instead, I started building up immunity to a lot of the medication I was taking. And instead of healing myself, I was in the long run actually making myself a lot more ill. And my gut and stomach suffered tremendously from all of this medication I was taking. So I decided it was time for something new and I began researching natural healing methods 
as Hippocrates once said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Um, so a common theme kept coming up in my searches that kept leading me back to the same thought. And that's that meat and dairy essentially were the cause to a lot of the problems I was having. So um, having grown up believing that meat was the only way to get protein, I never thought that meat could actually be harming me. We're, we're brought up with these ideas so deeply ingrained within us that we don't ever question them. It's only when we get sick or ill or have any problems that we actually begin to question our lifestyle. So um, I decided to then challenge these beliefs and I gave up all animal products. I felt I had a choice between believing what I was taught in the Western world and being reliant on medication my whole life or spending a bit of time researching and finding natural cures. So I then spent a bit of time researching and I tried out many different avenues from a homeopathic medicine to allopathic and I finally found a solution using plant-based foods as medicine. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by plant-based foods, I mean a diet rich in vegetables, fruit, grains, nuts, seeds, herbs. Um, and then, so in the West, we're so reliant on medicine. When we have a problem, I think actually it's all over the world, when we have a problem, we, instead of actually investigating the pr what the problem is, and we try to hide the symptoms instead of investigating and eliminating the root cause of the problem. So I now use food as my medicine and I don't take any form of medication. I began finding fresh, local, live, living food and began seeing that when you eat something living, fruits and vegetables, it actually puts that life and energy back into you. Um, I've now been following this lifestyle for many years and um, my symptoms began to improve and reverse immediately and my skin cleared up, I felt more energetic and I put life, essentially life back into my body. So I then spent the next couple of years afterwards studying on nutrition and I went and spent a lot of time in a health center in America called Hippocrates Health Institute um, where they have a lot of patients with many different illnesses from cancer to diabetes and through changing their diet they were able to heal themselves without any medication, without chemotherapy, without insulin medication. And this was, for me, an amazing thing to see and also like to, for people to be able to heal themselves through diet alone, that is what we need to aim towards. And so I feel like a great way to just see what we're designed to eat is to look at the animal kingdom. Um, we're most closely related to that of primates. So monkeys, chimpanzees, gorillas, with 99.4% of our DNA sequences the same as a chimpanzee. And if you look at a chimpanzee on and gorilla, we have very similar features. We, our hands, we have flattened teeth for grinding plant-based matters. But then if you compare that to a carnivorous animal like the tiger, for instance, they have claws, they have sharp fangs for ripping into their prey and essentially attacking and eating their prey. Something we don't have, we're not adapted like that. And so it turns out we look different, but it also turns out that our digestive system and bodies are built differently as well. We, our intestine is about 30 feet long, which is about 12 times the length of our body. And it's designed this way so that there is enough time to absorb all the plant and fruit matter which is quickly broken down and moves our body much quicker than animal protein does. Um, the, the, car the tiger for instance, carnivorous animals, have a much shorter intestine which is only about three times the length of their bodies and it's, it's designed like this because it's designed to be short so that it can, the plant matter can quickly move through their bodies um, Sorry. Um, to get, it's designed so it can quickly get rid of all the acidic waste that is the byproduct of animal protein. Um, so that we are designed very different. So it turns out we are designed differently, but we have the biological makeup of a gorilla, but we're eating like a tiger. So th 
this is going to cause a lot of problems for our bodies. Um, we're essentially, our bodies are like cars in a way. If you fill them up with the wrong petrol, you're going to run into a lot of problems. The car will eventually stop and not work anymore. And our bodies are the same. There's, you can go on so long putting the wrong products and eating the wrong stuff, but after a while, it's going to catch up with you and you'll start getting, people will start getting ill and sick. And this, that's the precursor of illness. So we can get all the nutrients and energy our cells need from a plant-based diet, through a vegetarian diet. So there's no reason for us to be eating animal protein. All animal foods have their origin from plants. Plants convert the sun's energy into fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, and they pull, pull up the minerals from the soil. Um, so when you eat animal products, you're essentially eating plants secondhand. And also things you don't need, like, carcin like saturated fats, cholesterol, and then carcinogenic animal protein. So for instance, a cow eats the grass. The grass is essentially the life force for the cow where it gets all its nutrients from. And when you eat the cow, you are getting the nutrients secondhand because you're essentially getting what the cow ate. So we need to instead be eating straight from the source and eating the plant matter. When people have a big meat meal, they, how do you usually feel afterwards? Most people usually feel sluggish, slow, lethargic, don't have a lot of energy because all your energy then is spent trying to digest the meal you've just eaten instead of spending the energy elsewhere. We need to be eating lighter foods, essentially, which give us the energy and life. For instance, in many countries that eat large amounts of meat, like Argentina, Spain, they all take siestas after their meals because all their energy then is spent trying to digest all this meat they've just consumed. Um, the one question I always get asked when people find out I'm vegetarian is where do you get your protein from? Protein is a big thing that people, mis a misconception essentially. Um, plants are a fantastic source of protein. Everything in life needs protein to live and fruits and vegetables are no exception to this. By consuming a wholesome plant-based diet, you will receive more than enough to satisfy your body's needs. It may surprise you actually to discover that greens are one of your best sources of instantly absorbable alkaline protein. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein and green vegetables are loaded with these muscle building nutrients. How do you think cows get their magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, all the nutrients they need to survive? It's through plants. The green grass they eat contains all the phytonutrients they need to flourish. So we essentially need to be cutting out the middleman, the cow, and going straight to the source and eating grass, essentially. Um, many people believe protein is a solution, but it's actually the problem. It can be a problem. You actually need far less of it than we are taught. And in reality, your body can only handle so much protein before it's stored as a toxin or eliminated. Efficient and clean bodies need very little protein to regenerate normal muscle growth, generate heat, and stimulate energy. Animal flesh does not provide the human physiology with critical amino acids or vitamins as readily as from a plant-based source. The deficiencies that vegetarians and vegans often encounter are caused by highly acid-forming diets, processed foods, bad combinations, and so on, not by the lack of protein and certainly not by the lack of animal flesh. Flesh foods are not ideal for us. They are much more di difficult to digest than plant vegetation and also generate excessive amounts of uric acid that increase harmful acidity to the body. The slow transit times of these concentrated foods may cause fermentation and gas pressure the cause that causes inflammation, which is the precursor to most illnesses. Herbivores such as elephants, horses, and gorillas consume entirely plant-based diets, and they certainly don't lack any strength or muscle. If these animals can all live on greens, why can't we? Um, so I've been in Bhutan now for, I think, five days. And 
I've visited and well, I've walked through a lot of farms and I've been to in Timpu actually the fruit and vegetable market and here there's such a wide variety of plant matters of fruits and vegetables and grains and the fact that everything is uh, well most of everything here is organic and local you're way ahead essentially of many other places in the world in England now we went so far away from organic and everyone started spraying all their crops with chemicals that we've now realized what a mistake we've made and are trying to move back towards what you essentially have here. Um, the problem though is vegetarian, you can be a very unhealthy vegetarian. It, just because you're vegetarian doesn't mean you're healthy. And um, because a lot of people that go vegetarian then want to substitute their diet with a lot of oils, fats, a lot of pasta, a lot of things essentially that don't provide us with a lot of nutrients. And people start becoming anemic, cal having calcium deficiencies, lack of B vitamins, and plants, plants, a lot of leafy greens like spinach, kale, um, what are, you have a, sp a lot of asparagus here. They're great sources of calcium and iron. Spinach actually and c kale contain more iron per calories than meat does. Um, and the lack of B vitamins that a lot of people have due to vegetarian diet is also because the soil is where you get a lot of, is where you essentially get B vitamins from. And it's a bacteria that's grown in the soil which is on the vegetables. But most people now overcook all their vegetables, which destroys, as soon as you cook something, it destroys a lot of the nutrients in the food. And overcooking it kills most of, a lot of everything that's good, the goodness in the food. So we, we want to be having not so overcooked stuff and covered in oil to essentially get all the nutrients and vitamins we need from a plant-based diet. Um, we're part of a greater whole here, and the choices we make aren't just about us. What we buy and eat is, just not, crit is not just critical to one's own health, it's also, of course, critical and relevant to those living beings we choose to eat or not eat. And it's critical to the survival of species and to the survival of the planet Earth. So I hope I was clear and made and um, was clear to everybody, and it's time, I believe, for a change, and any meal you can essentially move towards eating more vegetables is a great step. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I'd like to ask you individual questions first, and then I'll open up the floor to questions, and then again get some reactions and ask you questions again. And there are certain points that I'd like all three of you to react uh, from the diverse backgrounds that you come from. Uh, Kembo, I actually uh, wanted to talk to you about. And yes, I finally confirmed that we don't have sin in Buddhism. A lot of us like to use sin. Uh, and I sat with Kembo, finally, somebody who is very comfortable in English, and I uh, could understand him very clearly. He has confirmed that we prefer to use unwholesome acts or be getting negative karma. Um, so yes, so we don't have the idea of sin. And uh, in fact, I was just reading, it's a Western writer, of course, and I think it's because uh, it's lost in translation and for the lack of a better word, we prefer to replace all of that with sin. So then uh, what Kimbo, you, you were differentiating between, um, you know how people use the differences between Theravada as well as Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana to actually uh, make an excuse for being able to eat meat. Um, there was something that I was reading and uh, it was from the history of vegetarianism in Tibet, like Kimbo, we just we were talking about it earlier at the lounge. Um, there, I read something about the unwholesome act that there's a difference. Now, this is where the difference is drawn: the act of meeting, eating meat as an unwholesome act, and the act of killing also as an unwholesome act. And then there's a difference drawn there, saying that perhaps the act of eating meat, if you haven't intentionally killed the animal, is uh, does not have a greater negative impact than the act of killing. I would like to re you to react to that, like about. Well, going by your question, I think um, what Lord Buddha said was that it's called Tongte Doksum, which means having seen and then having a doubt uh, and then having hurt. If you were to, if you, for a monk or any person, 
that who have heard that it's being killed for yourself, that for a specific person, and then also if you doubt that, oh, this meat must have been you know, slaughtered from my consumption, and then also if you have seen somebody killing it for yourself, then you, ha you have the full unwholesome action, that you have the all three points. But if you don't have that, Evan Lord Buddha said that you don't really have the unwholesome action because, for example, like if I go to a restaurant and order a meat, and then, I mean, indirectly you're involved in it because if you haven't ordered it, you, it wouldn't be, the meat wouldn't be there. But still, since you haven't seen it being slaughtered, since you don't have a doubt that it's being killed for you, then you don't have the full unwholesome action. So if you know that it's certainly being killed for yourself, and you have seen it, and you have heard that it's being killed for you, which is tongte doksum. If you, ha if you have both, three, no, the, all the three points, then you get the full unwholesome action. The Tatalhenso itself has really um, has a lot of uh, taken taken a lot of initiatives to ensure that uh, the Putinese population in general actually reduces our intake of meat. Um, very noble initiatives, and I think with the, the utmost good intent. Unfortunately, a lot of us Putinese like meat, and unfortunately, a lot of us like to hoard. So then this special holy month, because you vi you're visiting Putan for the first time, and David, you're here for the second time. But um, what happens is when these, uh, they, we call this the Sagadawas, right, the holy months. Um, so when it's about, when it draws nearer, so people start stocking food. I know for a fact that our hoteliers will actually book kilos of meat in advance. It's hidden in the deep freezer, freezer and everybody comes, but there's meat in the freezer and they'll be like, oh no, it's not for you, it's already booked. And it's like 50, 60, 80 kilos of meat. Um, Kembola, don't you think then it defeats the purpose? I mean, of course, uh, Venerable Sulalabe himself was also sharing how he was actually promoting what you would call flexitarianism, um, that you don't have to be vegetarian throughout the year, because even in the teachings of the Buddha, he doesn't force you, but if you would attempt to become a vegetarian, then these are certain steps that you can actually um, take to become a full uh, vegetarian then. What about if you could comment on a hypocritical behavior and how we could change our attitude? La? Well, I think that would be really hard to do. Uh, but we can s start up with a very single step. You know, as I said, you know, we got to start somewhere else. For example, uh, with killing of animals during Saga, um, before Sagadawa, it's really sad you know, to know that and to see all those things happening. The first step that we could do is just um, as a lay practitioner or as a beginner, one can actually implement or initiate a prog program where we can skip a meal. Like for example, if you go to a restaurant during that month, you know, instead of ordering, a m instead of ordering meat, y you can just say, you know, can I have a vegetarian meat? You know, that would be one s very uh, initiative and a very simple step by saying, you know, if they say, hey, if you ask, like, do you have dumplings? And if they say, oh yeah, we have meat dumplings, then instead of saying instead of saying meat, you could say, can I have uh, cheese or some kind of vegetables? So though I think that's one way of you know starting it from the very first. And I think there will be there are many, but I think that's the sim simplest step we can take. I think uh, I think there's a realization among Putinese actually. I remember when I returned to Putan after college, there was really just one vegetarian restaurant that I could go to called Gassel Hotel. That was not really purely veg. I think it was purely veg. But now I'm happy to share after discussions with uh, Odiki that uh, she was telling me Putan Sweets offers a full vegetarian menu. And there's the South Indian restaurant that is, offers full vegetarian menu. Then there's Ambient Cafe that also has a full vegetarian menu. And by the way, these vegetarian menus are not boring. They're quite exciting if you actually want to, um, if you keep an open mind and go to these uh, places. Hotel Shanti Deva and what Kembo actually shared, uh, DGPC, Drew Green Power Corporation actually, I think uh, it was with the Changsa Trust that they approached this corporation. And uh, they actually have taken, are going to take the initiative uh, to have veg meals for the events, vegetarian meals for all the events. I think this is a fantastic initiative, not because I'm a vegetarian, but because of the very convincing arguments that have been made by the speaker so far. 
Myanmar. Um, if you would like to try the vegetarian options available for you in Bhutan, which is not Ema Tatsi, you're most welcome to try these restaurants. Um, it's difficult, you know. I wanted to share the Bhutanese diet with both of you as well. You were talking about how you experienced being vegetarian in New York was so much easier than returning to Hong Kong and eating that chicken leg and the wonderful meat that you get to eat in Hong Kong. Um, it's, you know, and then your presentation, fantastic, by the way, the kind of information that you managed to distill from the not so interesting documents that are available online, I think it really hit home with everybody who's sitting here because you spoke in a language that could be understood by all of us. Another thing about Bhutanese, we have a sense of humor. So that thing you said about how much uh, methane um, a cow actually puts back into the atmosphere and contributing to global warming, a Putinese would come to you and say, you know what, actually I think I'm helping, you know, because I removed that cow from the equation so that cow does not live anymore to produce that amount. I know you guys thought that, <laughs> see, you're all laughing. So see, you have this. So how do you counter such an argument? Well, first of all, um, I think, uh, uh, not th uh, th different people will make up different arguments, you know, to justify why they can still eat meat. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, we are not trying to eliminate meat. Um, the message or the slogan or the whole campaign of, let's say, Green Monday, which actually is very similar to like Meat Free Monday in the UK or Meatless Monday in the US, is that um, we are just trying to shift people's behavior to eat less meat and more green. Because after all, I mean, we are not, I, I doubt our ability to fully convert people to become full vegetarian. So actually, behind the message of Green Monday is, is very zen, is that, um, you know, in, in Buddhism, we talk about finding the middle way. You know, everything, you know, anytime when you swing to an extreme is not good. So a middle way um, or a common ground, a common platform is usually what is best to hopefully you bring most people on board. And um, I guess when people make arguments against vegetarianism or try to justify meat, I say, well, you know, take it easy. You know, take it easy. We're not attacking you. We're not attacking the meat eaters. Um, we are not saying that you need to eliminate it completely. But um, let's try to be greener, you know, if you want a better planet, if you want better health. Now, of course, um, Going back to one element that actually is very interesting is that actually not addressed, not necessarily addressed by uh, Campbell, by Emily, or even by myself. There's one, there's a fourth element which is very important. Okay, you have vegetarianism and Buddhism. You have vegetarianism and uh, environment, vegetarianism and health. But final, last but not least, is vegetarianism and taste. You know, how do you make good tasting food, you know. If the food itself tastes good, quite frankly, it doesn't matter if it is a meat dish or a non-meat dish, people will like it. So one of the biggest obstacles has always been, you know, why do people justify eating meat? Is that they think meat tastes better. But of course, Emily can say much more to it, is that it's only because through the processing that they're adding a lot of chemicals and salt and, you know, ingredients that are actually not good for our health. But Another element is how can we cook more delicious, more yummy vegetarian dishes? And if you can achieve that, you know, then you know, that's when the paradigm really starts to shift because you are no longer talking about a sacrifice. You know, you're no longer talking about a sacrifice. You're talking about a real gain that I'm eating healthier, I'm eating more environmentally conscious, more animal conscious, but last but not least, they taste good. So um, one of the things that we do is, after talking about all the benefits, is we go to the restaurants, exactly like you said, is challenge the restaurant and say that, first of all, there are markets for vegetarian or green eaters. I can assure you they are green eaters because globally this trend is happening. You know, people like Bill Clinton, people like Al Gore, people like Paul McCartney, people like Brad Pitt, Natalie Portman, you know, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, these people, even they are either full vegetarian or like 70, 80 percent. And these people are all doing it. So this is a global trend. So we challenge the restaurants and say, make better and more delicious vegetarian dish. And of course, wholesome as well. And then the earlier these restaurants create good tasting dishes, the earlier they attract new business. And once that puzzle is solved, once that bottleneck is broken, then that's when the tipping point shifts. And 
all the restaurants now in Hong Kong want to join the movement because so all of a sudden they become a caring company, they become an environmentally friendly company, and last but not least, they are gaining new business. They are gaining new business. So I guess at the end of the day, after all the reasons, after all the numbers, um, one thing that we cannot trick ourselves is that we must make vegetarian food taste good because that's how people ultimately will make the decision on what to eat.